You know the truth because you must if you want to be set free. Set free from the bondage of sin. Set free from the deceit of this world. From the counterfeit of Satan. From his lies. So that we can walk in, and here's the key, that you and I can walk in obedience to the will of God. If you are a follower of Messiah Yeshua, then what is going to be of the utmost importance to you is the will of God. That is going to be one of the things that you pray day and night, night and day, to have revealed to you. That you might know His will, as we talked about several weeks ago. It is only when I am committed to the will of God, is God going to teach me His knowledge. So let's begin with a very simple question. Are you interested in God's will? Or are you one of these individuals that exploit God's grace? Believing that if you receive Messiah, taking hold of that grace, thanking Him for dying upon that cross, now He's there for you to solve your problems, to give to you the desires of your heart. Usually that's the desires of your flesh so that you can accomplish what you want. That's not biblical spirituality. That is not the truth of the Word of God. Well, take out your Bible and look with me once more to the Epistle to the Colossians in chapter 1. The Epistle to the Colossians in chapter 1. Here Paul is going to speak very fervently about something that you and I need to understand. If we're truly going to be people, that God is well pleased with. And isn't that your desire? Don't you want to be someone as a believer that when you go before God, He says, well done. Not you were deceived, you were useless, you were not walking in truth, you were not committed to me and my principles and my purposes. You don't want to hear that. You want to hear, well done. You want to be a praise unto God. And how do we achieve that? Well, take out your Bible, look if you would to chapter 1, and we're going to begin with verse 23. And here I want to deal with a problem, and that is that so frequently a preconceived theological perspective influences how one translates the Word of God. And that's so unfortunate. What we see is that individuals translate things in order to support their beliefs rather than taking the Word of God as it is and allowing our doctrine, our theology to be based upon the revelation of God. Now, what I'm talking about here is a very important Greek word. It is the word a, and it can be translated if or since. Now, it's not a word in order to sow doubt, but it's better translated in most places with the word sense. Now, realize something. Paul is speaking to those that he calls saints, those who are fellow believers, those who have made a commitment to Messiah, those who have believed the truth of the gospel. So there's nothing uncertain about who he's speaking to. And Paul is not someone that wants to plant doubt in someone's mind. Meaning this, Paul is not going to, to encourage people to fall away. He is not going to believe that they're going to do the wrong thing. He wants to encourage them to do the right thing. We need to have a good understanding of what he's been saying. Because what he has said forms the context for understanding what he's going to say. Look again at verse 23. It's two Greek words put together. It's a word, ege. Ge is a word, uh, also, or and. And a, as I said, means sense. It is not a, a statement of doubt. There's a different construction if he was doing this in the subjunctive posing a doubt, a possibility. No, Paul is writing here 
wanting to encourage. And he says this, we who have been reconciled, we who have been transferred from the power of darkness into the kingdom of light, those who have been reconciled by the blood of Messiah through his death on the cross, all of this positions us in a great potential to walk with God. And that's what he's talking about in verse 23. He's not sowing doubt. He says, since also you remain in the faith, establish and firm, or the word has to do with that which is stable. So he's speaking about being established and having stability. Through what? Through the faith. It is wrong to say, and if you, why does he want to say if? He is encouraging them. He's talking, the context is the benefits of, of being a believer. The outcome of Messiah, His presence through the Holy Spirit in our life. So He's not sowing seeds of doubt. He is affirming something. Look again. Since also you remain in the faith, being established and firm, and not moving away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard that has been proclaimed in all of creation under the heavens, which Paul says, I have become a, a minister. So Paul is not, the context is not doubt. It's not if you continue, but it says since you continue. And he's talking about the benefits of that. So look again at this verse. He promises here that we're going to be because of this continuation. Paul's confident of these people. He says that you are going to be established and, and made firm. And not only that, he promises as well that we're not going to be moved away from what? Hope. Now, this is the second time that he's spoken of hope. And if you look carefully, the hope that he's speaking about is this inheritance. And he wants to not warn us by saying, uh, you know, you're going to lose that inheritance. No. Once you inherit something, it's not going to be lost. Now, you may not inherit as much as you could, but, but God, when we do something right, it is going to be refined with spiritual fire. It is going to be more, more precious, more perfected by God. So he's not talking about suffering loss, but he's talking about uh, earning. So he says, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard that has been proclaimed in all of creation under heaven, which I have become a minister, whose now I rejoice. Notice what he says. Now, he's not talking about the context would not be warning them and now joy. No, he's talking, he's affirming something to them. And it's that affirmation that gives him joy. Look again at verse 24. Which now I rejoice in my suffering my suffering in behalf of you so paul he's making sacrifices we talked about this a few weeks ago that when we are walking with god it is going to cause us to suffer we're going to live a sacrificial a giving life and paul is doing things in order to have a positive influence in growing them discipling them in the truth but he's suffering Many scholars believe that Paul wrote this epistle as he did others from prison, being put into prison because of his desire to minister to this congregation and others. So he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings in behalf of you and completing. It's a word to fill up, to fill up that which is lacking of the afflictions of Messiah in my flesh in behalf of his body, what body is he talking about? Which is the church. Now understand what he's saying. Because we need to be careful. If we don't understand it theologically correctly, we're going to miss out 
on his simple message. Paul is speaking about a congregation. He says, you know what? Even though this is understood, what Messiah did, he did perfectly. He provided everything to redeem us eternally, to forgive all of our sins. What he did on the cross was sufficient. It was complete. It was, as he says, it is finished, meaning it was done perfectly. So what's he talking about? That which was lacking. Well, Messiah, he did the work of redemption. He paid the price completely. But in order to get that message out, in order to disciple people in that message, to grow them, we also, see, what are we called? We're called the body of Messiah. We participate in carrying on his ministry. That's why we've been given his spirit. So Paul says, understand something. Yes, indeed, what Messiah did upon that cross, it was all sufficient. It was perfect. We don't do anything in paying any of the price for redemption. He paid it all. But in order that his purpose to see people redeemed, forgiven, and made into a kingdom people, brought into the congregation of the redeemed, that means that we also participate and carry on this ministry. And just like he suffered, guess what? We're going to suffer too. Now, our suffering is not in any way paying that price. He paid it in full. But believers, for the ministry of Messiah, for the purposes of Messiah, we are going to suffer as well. We have a role in completing the purpose of Messiah, not the work of redemption, but the outcome of that proclamation being given and growing people up. So Paul says, I rejoice in this call. I don't mind this suffering in behalf of the, the church. Verse 25. For which I became a servant according to, and this word here, uh, I don't know how it's translated. It could be the word administration or management. It's literally the word for uh, building up a home or, or managing a household. So it has an idea of doing something. Messiah paid the price in full for sin so that we could be a kingdom people. But now Paul's saying, I've been called into this ministry so that I can play a role in this building up of the body of Messiah, the congregation of the redeemed according to the administration of God that's why Paul's become a minister it says that was given to me in behalf of you for the fulfillment of the word of God in this word word logos it can be basically the blueprint Paul is working in order that the purpose the blueprint actually becomes a reality God, Paul, is looking at the will of God, living his life, doing things in order for the plan of God to become a reality. He's doing that for the life of the people in this congregation and others that he meet. And guess what? We're supposed to do that same thing. We look at the will of God. That is that blueprint. We look at the will of God and we participate in bringing that about the outcome of redemption and that is changed life through messiah and his spirit what happens a great potential salvation lives are changed they're transformed but it's through discipleship it's through the ministry of the word of god that lives are are transformed taking that power of the cross and making it into a reality look now to verse 26 He's going to be speaking about, and we're going to come across this word frequently in the next couple of weeks. Look at verse 26. The mystery that has been revealed or hidden, excuse me, the mystery that has been concealed or hidden from the ages, and we could translate that the world, and from the generations. So now something is changing. God is revealing something that has been hidden he's revealing it to here's the emphasis 
on the nations. Why is that important? Because God's kingdom purposes, it's not just about one nation. It was using one nation to bless all the families of the earth. And this is why this is so vital for us. Look at what he says here. The mystery that was concealed from the world and from the generations, but now is being revealed to his saints, whom God desired to make known what is the richness of the glory of this mystery. This, this mystery. And what is that ministry? Into the nations. That God's mystery, see, Judaism, it didn't understand it. That God's purpose was for the nations. That all the people of the world would be transformed. This is what he's speaking about. So it was God's will to make known the richness of the glory of this mystery to the nations. And what was that mystery? That it's Messiah in you, the hope of glory. That Messiah, and here today, Judaism frequently says, well, you know, Jesus might be the, the Messiah for the Gentiles, but, but he's not for us. I mean, it's fine for people who are not Jewish to, to follow this, this Christianity, but it has nothing for Jewish people. Well, that's, that's a lot. What this scripture is revealing is this, the exact opposite. Naturally, Messiah, Yeshua, is for Israel. But the mystery that they didn't know is that this one is for the nations as well. They didn't understand the purpose, what the heart of God was for the nations. And that's what's being emphasized here. Whom we proclaim, and not only proclaim, he uses a very strong word here. We admonish. What does that mean? Admonishing is warning people of a consequence if they don't agree and participate with this. So he says that we are revealing and admonishing who? Every Jew? No, all people. And teaching all people in all wisdom in order that they should uh, present it to all, present it, present all men perfect, complete, whole, how? In Messiah Yeshua. Now hear that. The purpose of the gospel is that all people are presented, how? They are presented, and the implication is presented before God the Father for entrance into the kingdom of God, that they would be presented, every man, perfect, and there's that phrase again, in Messiah Yeshua. So important. There is no hope, there is no expectation of receiving any of the promises of God, being someone who God is going to work with unless you're in Messiah. And the question that is so vital that everyone must understand is how do I find myself in Messiah? Well, that expression, in Messiah, it is a covenantal word. You can only be in Messiah if you're in a covenantal relationship with him. What covenant am I speaking about? I'm speaking about the new covenant. And realize the new covenant, hopefully you've heard me say this many times before, the new covenant, it is a kingdom covenant. It is a covenant, according to Jeremiah 31, it is a covenant of forgiveness. And it's a covenant of not just God forgiving us of sins, he says, I will remember them no more. Now, let me ask you something. If God, who cannot lie, whose promises we can have assurance with, if he says, I'm going to forgive all of your sins, and I'm going to remember them no more, why wouldn't we have assurance? Why wouldn't we boldly come before him? Because here's the biblical truth. When a believer in Messiah Yeshua, through that gospel, What's the gospel? Good news about redemption. What redemption? The redemption of Messiah Yeshua. Redemption needs two, two aspects, death and blood. Messiah's death and the shedding of his blood, both of those are vital. 
They're part of the equation. Therefore, when I become a recipient of his redemption, God promises me through that redemption, the sufficiency of the cross, all, 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 all of my sins, my iniquities, my transgressions are forgiven. How long are they forgiven for? Always. What portion? All of them. Every one of them. Therefore, God says, don't miss out on the simplicity of this. He says, your sins I will remember no more. So when I go before God, no matter what I have done in my past, there's sufficiency in the blood of Messiah. Therefore, I can go before him on judgment day with confidence, with assurance, with a boldness that's pleasing to him. Not bold in my, of myself, but bold, confident about the sufficiency of what he's done, his plan to save me. And the reason why I'm so confident is because all of my sins, he doesn't remember. He has no knowledge of them. What does he remember? What does he see? What does he know? He knows the righteousness of his son. That's when he sees me. That's what he's seen. The righteousness, the perfection of Messiah. And therefore, I can have confidence that I can walk right into the kingdom of God. Through his grace, having believed, having exercised faith in what he has done. I have not played a role in that. I don't get any praise. I deserve no thanksgiving for receiving it. It is a gift that one exercises by faith. And he provides, he doesn't make us faithful, but he provides to our conscience that which we can understand and we can respond to. Someone says, well, wait a second. I thought the Bible says you were dead in your trespasses. Yes dead in a relationship with God. You have no hope because of your sin, but you still have a conscience. You still can understand revelation, a portion of it, enough to be saved. And then you go through a process of regeneration and growth where you can understand more and more and more of the things of God. So look at the scripture. The purpose is this, that we might be presented that's why he says all men, that includes you and me. The word is teleon, that is complete, lacking nothing. It means perfect, perfect in Messiah Yeshua, verse 29. Now, verse 29 tells us something. It talks about Paul as a servant. Here's another word. Paul as a laborer. Why is Paul a laborer? Just what we talked about because of the sufficiency of the gospel, that it really does save. It really brings about regeneration. It really brings about peace and joy and contentment. And therefore, Paul, he loves that. And because he's experienced that, he just wants to share that with others. And his life's dedicated to it. How do I know that? Look at verse 29. He says, for which also, which is the gospel for bringing people perfect before God, having that privilege. He says, for which also I labor and are striving according to his working. Now, he does the work. We, we participate. We tell the message. We tell what he's done. We take his truth and reveal it. But it's all him, him, him. We are just heralds of that. We are laboring for what he has completed. We simply tell it so people can receive it. And we explain it more and more, the word of God, so people can grow and mature and reduplicate themselves in the lives of other people. That is an apostleship. That is what Paul is committed to. So he says here, again, verse 29, for which I labor and striving according to his working, that uh, uh, the work in me would be powerful or mighty. Now, what Paul is saying here is this. All of this does something. When I am committed to 
the purposes of God. When I am understanding the will of God, His purpose, what God wants to bring about, and I want to see people presented perfect before God to be part of that kingdom, you know what God does? God works in me. How? Notice what He says. That His working in me that works might be mighty. And it's really not might be, it will be mighty. So when we are humbling ourselves, turning away from our fleshly desires, embracing the truth and the call and the purposes of God, when we are interested in the things that interest God, when we are acting in the knowledge of God, you know what we're going to become? We are going to become recipients of His power. And that power is going to be released through us. We receive it for the purpose of releasing it into the lives of other people. Whereby they become saved, justified, redeemed. And God goes to work in them. And through that work in them, you know what happens? They begin to work in the lives of other people. And more and more and more people are brought into a kingdom reality, a kingdom hope, a kingdom character. And that's what excites Paul. So let me ask you a question. Do these things excite you? Are these things something that you want to participate in? Is this the passion of your life? Let me tell you, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you are going to be in agreement with this. You're going to want to focus on the work of God and be a recipient, you're going to realize how much you are in need of God's power, His anointing in your life so that you can accomplish that which is praiseworthy and that which is pleasing to Him. My hope is this, what we've studied today might give you a new passion, a renewed passion, or maybe a new one for the purposes of God. Well, once more, I'm out of time until next week when we continue on in chapter 2.